This is C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. This week, suburbia after the civil rights movement. Johns Hopkins University professor Nathan Connolly explores the role of zoning, eminent domain, and property rights in the making of racial housing categories. He also explains how these tools were often used by local governments to stop neighborhood desegregation. I wanted to try to find a way to think about suburbia as a hinge point in the semester. We've been having discussions now for about six weeks on a variety of different themes and issues, um, dealing with black political officials, um, the compounded identities that people have when race, class, gender, and sexuality kind of overlap and intersect. We spent a fair amount of time discussing civil rights symbolism, right? Individuals who represent something to the movement. Um, and that theme of symbolism is going to come up again as it concerns housing and citizenship as represented through real estate. And there's also an issue about law and the enforcement of those laws that help to get our class going and is going to be a thread that continues through the semester and in large part hangs on this question of land and suburbia. Um, Now, we had readings that dealt with Charlotte, North Carolina, Miami, Los Angeles. We've already read uh, Daniel Hosang's stuff on kind of the state of California. And so we're getting a sense of what the national picture is looking like. And one of the things that's really fascinating and interesting about where the historical scholarship is now is that civil rights history and the history of land are really starting to blend together um, because land is a constant. And so many of the ways in which discrimination and oppression translate from generation to generation occurs through land and is expressed through land. And so what I'm going to try to do this morning is have you think about a set of ideas, four big ideas mostly, Um, And also how the symbolism of the suburban and the urban can sometimes get really slippery. But I want to tell you a little bit of a story first. This image is one of my personal favorites. It's from Miami, and it celebrates the opening of an under-expressway park. Now, this photo was taken by the city of Miami's tourism department as a way of celebrating the city and celebrating the progress that the city had made through the collaboration of black and white officials. Now, there are a couple of really important things to note in the photograph. The obvious, of course, is this overhead expressway. This is I-95, which runs from downtown Miami all the way up to Maine. And through the 1960s, through a combination of interstate highway projects as well as urban renewal efforts, slum clearance efforts, the upheaval of the black downtown was absolute. Almost 40,000 residents left the area, moved to surrounding communities, and this was seen as a kind of peace offering for the blacks whose homes had been taken. The other big detail that is quite small is the grass around the poles on the jungle gym itself. You notice very closely, you can see that the grass is so new, it's laying up against the actual jungle gym. This is totally a staged photo. The grass is brand new, even though it's kind of patchy. Um, And there's a a way that this jungle gym in its small size and the children in their kind of poverty with, you know, tattered clothes represent the state of black Miami at the end of the 1960s. Now, the key thing to keep in mind is that even though this was an urban event, it had very strong suburban echoes. Miami's black community since the mid-1950s had been moving en masse out of the black downtown to surrounding suburbs. Much of the black leadership, pictured here behind the mayor of Miami, Stephen Clark, had already moved to the suburbs. They were simply coming back as a kind of token effort to try to build this park and provide for their poor counterparts. But this effort could only occur through a kind of coalition that was built between black and white elites. And these kinds of coalitions, not just in southern cities, but also in urban spaces, were central to understanding the late 50s and the 1960s in terms of how urban governance worked. Remember when we talked about black mayors in the late 60s and the 70s and 80s, the kinds of negotiations they had to strike between representing the black grassroots as well as making their gestures to white power brokers, all of that was at stake in these kinds of small gestures. This image seemingly innocuous represents that back and forth between blacks and whites. On the left, you have Mayor Stephen Clark on the seesaw, um, looking kind of awkward, actually. Um, 
On the right, you have Athalie Range, whose name is actually attached to the park when it was opened. And she's there dressed in, you know, very obvious middle class finery, heels and a purse, you know, representing the race in, in the best way she knows how. And she is extremely important for Miami politics and its history because she was the first black city commissioner, the first black female city commissioner, and in large measure is considered a legend in local politics for her fight against desegregation and other kinds of forms of oppression. Now, the other key image in this picture that I find most striking is, of course, the young man to the far left with no shirt and no shoes. Right? Um, again, abject poverty in the midst of this back and forth between black and white elites. Now the image is a powerful one, I think, in its simplicity. And in understanding black suburbia, you have to understand that there are a number of key themes that oftentimes get missed. This is a picture that was in your reading for this week from the essay Sunbelt Civil Rights and it actually represents the event that occurred and sparked the establishment of Athlete Range Park. Relations between blacks and whites had soured, mostly surrounding the Republican National Convention that was in Miami in August of 1968. And the event caused such a stir and such bad publicity that the gesture that was made between the city and local black uh, elites was in large measure, tr measure trying to conceal and cover up and help the country and the city get past this kind of event. Now this young man is unnamed in the photo that they provide um, on Corbis, but there's a couple of, again, key symbolic components here. One is the familiarity of the grammar of the urban crisis. Black youth, white law enforcement, white helmets, right? This is 1968 in the string of urban unrest. However, look at the background. This is occurring in a community with ranch style dwellings, with lawns, with presumably new automobiles, right? This is actually a representation of what can be called a suburban crisis. There are four basic lessons that I want us to think about as it concerns black suburbanization and America's struggle with racial segregation. The first is that human beings must actively pursue and maintain racial segregation, building both institutional and spatial infrastructure. What I mean by that, of course, is that segregation does not happen by accident. It does not happen through seemingly natural population flows, through mysterious workings of the market. It takes human agency to negotiate, to redraw, to unmake communities, and continually redraw the color line. Racial segregation is profitable. Again, one of the myths that surround discussions of racial segregation is ending was that somehow segregation was too expensive to maintain. If you had to build one bathroom for whites, you had to build one bathroom for blacks. However, through the segmentation of the residential marketplace, through the means of racial segregation, whites oftentimes had to pay more for suburban housing and blacks had to pay more to live in rental property or to get access to certain kinds of suburbs. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Racial segregation has historically depended not on the protection of, but on the violation of property rights. You remember from our reading last week with Daniel Ho saying how the discourse of property rights became a very handy method for whites to oppose Proposition 14 in California. And much of the history that talks about suburbanization and white flight and racial exclusivity points to how whites marshal arguments of property rights. You see it again pop up in the last sort of reading from last week, right, around busing. If you have the ability to afford a certain home, you have the ability to afford a certain kind of school. However, when you look at the long history of property rights, you recognize that restrictive covenants are, in some measure, a hampering of property rights. Racial zoning is a hampering of property rights. And, it, and you think about black property rights and it opens it up even further. So we'll spend some time talking about that. And the fourth point that we'll try to explore this morning is that desegregation policies through, through the state's lack of enforcement actually enable white supremacy to become more advanced and modern. It's that gap between the passage of a law and that law's enforcement. 
the weakening of legislation, even as it represents a symbolic victory. That makes it much more difficult to create mass forms of direct action, make it much more difficult to engage in litigation and win in court, and make it much more difficult for American society more broadly to perceive that it has a racial problem on the same scale that once existed in the 1940s and 50s. The language around race is changing as a result of civil rights legislation, and that means that you have to have new mechanisms for understanding and unpacking how best to combat segregation's legacies. On the first lesson about human beings actively pursuing and maintaining segregation, we have racial zoning, restrictive covenants. You have the restricting of blacks to what are called unincorporated areas, areas outside of city limits. In Carver Ranches, Florida, for example, a community that was established in the 1940s did not have sewers until the mid-1980s. Residents in Carver Ranches had to protest for 12 years just to get paved streets. Now, in most situations where blacks and whites came together, in large numbers or around housing, you had moments of racial violence. This is an image taken from Detroit in 1942. The historian Tom Segru, in his landmark book, The Origins of the Urban Crisis, details the conflicts between blacks and whites that before his book, most people didn't even understand existed in the North. And this kind of signage, we want white tenants in our white community, was often a precursor to there being a violent clash between blacks and whites. The suburban crisis follows the urban crisis. To understand why blacks were pursuing suburbia, you also have to understand the condition of much of the housing that they were facing. Slum housing that didn't have bathrooms, didn't have pavement, you're talking about a sea of mud when it would rain in a lot of these communities. Things made out of fragile wood. And the idea is that through at least some negotiations with whites, white developers, white politicians, you can improve the housing stock of blacks, if not necessarily integrate. In the 1950s especially, you see coalitions emerge in city after city between white developers and black religious leaders and entrepreneurs to develop separate but equal suburbs for African Americans. This is from the dedication ceremony of Pontchartrain Park in 1955. Pontchartrain Park was the first black subdivision in New Orleans. 90% of the residents owned their own homes. Notable residents included Ernest Morial, who had become the first black mayor of New Orleans, and actor Wendell Pierce of The Wire fame and of Treme, is now trying to help rebuild Pontchartrain Park in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. The kind of dark area in the foreground of that image is Lake Pontchartrain. And all these homes here were occupied by African Americans. The park in the middle was a golf course designed by Joseph Bartholomew, who was an African American and designed golf courses throughout New Orleans, but because of segregation laws, was not allowed to play on any of the courses that he, in fact, designed, except, of course, at Pontchartrain Park. Practically without exception, the first generation of idyllic black suburbs, like Pontchartrain Park, would become, by the 1970s and 80s, suburban ghettos. Oftentimes, withdrawal of home finance or insurance would ensue. Blacks had very difficult time getting simple permits to keep their homes up. And there was a cycle of downward mobility in many black suburban spaces. Whites also built walls between black and white communities just to preserve the illusion of segregation that there were property values. Again, an intentionality there. This is a, a handful of black children leaning against the wall separating black and white housing in Detroit in 1942. Planners also used discontinuous street patterns. They would end a street for seemingly no reason at all as a way of keeping black and white housing separate. In Baltimore County in the 1970s, there were 24 different black enclaves that were essentially bounded off by the ending of streets for no reason in particular. This is an image I took yesterday morning at the corner of Southway Road and Greenmount Avenue, a discontinuous street in the city of Baltimore meant to separate the subdivision of Guilford from Greenmount. 
This is looking out from Guilford. You see the row homes there. Those three bars were actually put in place with, within the last year or so um, before they thought the, high, the uh, sidewalk would be enough to keep folks from driving over the median. This is looking in the other direction at the single family homes in Guilford. Now what's fascinating about this particular part of the city is my wife and I, when we were looking for homes to buy, the house directly along that wall was for sale. And it was in Guilford and $200,000 cheaper than homes simply down the block with the same number of bedrooms. The proximity to Greenmount had a direct bearing on how much you were gonna pay for that house. This brings me to the second lesson. Racial segregation is profitable. During the Jim Crow era, people could manipulate segregation's rules through blockbusting. You come in, you pay a black woman $45, $50 to push a carriage in a neighborhood where she does not not in fact live. Whites see it, they wanna panic sell to a speculator. Housing prices drop, he buys it up, turns around and sells it to black families at a premium, makes a killing. You have uh, zoning exceptions that are provided to speculators. An area that's zoned for industrial use, a uh, slumlord would go to the city and say, I, I want to get you to give me an exception on this community and have me put some slum housing on it, and I'll be able to generate higher profits. You have a number of approaches that revolve around contract selling. Some, you, instead of getting a straight-up mortgage, you enter into a deal with somebody who owns a house and say, I'll pay you $100 a month for the next 15 years, but through some kind of fine print, after 10 years or so, they find a way to take the house from you and you have no equity at all. Because of captive consumers, landlords in particular were able to generate ridiculous profits. In today's housing market, you can make between four or 6% annual return on a rental property. In 1970s Baltimore, black neighborhoods, you made 10 to 15% annual return. In the Jim Crow era, you can make between 27 and 60% annual return on a real estate. Your property would be paid off in at minimum three years, sometimes in two years' time, and the rest would be profit. All of this was aided through the help of the state. And the most famous, of course, being New Deal finance. We've talked a lot about how the FHA separated the marketplace by providing certain kinds of loans for whites and certain kinds of loans for blacks. One historian called the federal housing policies of the New Deal era the most successful segregation system in American history. But there's an even broader cultural point to keep in mind, that even in privileging whites with loans, home ownership was simply another form of long-term debt that helped banks and insurance companies get out of the depression. And with the endorsement of the federal government, the one-time stigma of carrying mortgage indebtedness became a sign of one's financial responsibility. There's a cultural shift that's occurring in the country that's really important. And as blacks try to take advantage of the new availability of housing, they're being steered by realtors away from white communities. The National Association of Real Estate Boards made their realtors swear an oath that they would not inject unfavorable populations into white communities and threaten the property values. In 1970, Larman Williams, an assistant school principal in St. Louis, Missouri, sought the help of his white pastor to circumvent the realtor that was blocking him from buying a particular home. This is a quote from him. My pastor went and knocked on their doors and he got them together and he had a caucus and a prayer meeting and decided that it was only right to sell to a black person. And then the person, the owner, called the real estate people and they came and got in contract with me and we made the transaction from there. The white pastor in this scenario, again, 1970, is very similar to the figure of Vern Tyson that we read about in Blood Then Sign Their Name, right? Religion becomes a, one way of trying to mediate these issues. But what's important to keep in mind about desegregation is that these small-scale efforts, or even when Brown v. Board was passed, only brought about new forms and new methods to try to maintain the color line. One way was to take a subdivision that was becoming integrated, to lobby the city to turn it into a public park or a golf course or some kind of infrastructure. They would use eminent domain and bulldoze it and reinscribe the color line. Another approach 
was to make new money for the private sector by privatizing formerly public institutions. You shut down public pools and open a private one in the suburbs. Private schools, private clubs, gated communities with private security forces. The beginnings of privatization as an approach to urban governance begin as response to desegregation in the 1950s. This image taken from a report from the US Commission of Civil Rights reflects that process, right? Whites carrying computers, supplies, airports from cities out to suburban communities, presumably. The historian Kevin Cruz writes that white flight from cities was not simply physical. Their withdrawal was unfolded in a less literal sense as they withdrew their support, political, social, and financial, from cities and a society they believed had already abandoned them. Two big pillars of modern conservative politics, anti-tax approaches and the, and the support of privatization, began as a form of massive resistance. And in some ways, the white suburbanite is thought of in the popular imagination and in the scholarly imagination as being the white flighter, the massive resistor. The historian Andrew Weiss writes, historians have done a better job of excluding African Americans from the suburbs than even white suburbanites. He wrote the book in 2004, when at the time, the very reality of black suburbia was being all but ignored. This brings me to a third lesson. Racial segregation has historically depended not on the protection, but on the violation of property rights. Since at least 1940, one in five black Americans lived in the suburbs. Sometimes 100-year-old black communities in rural areas would be surrounded by popping up suburban developments, and then through lobbying, those communities would be condemned and taken for different kinds of quote-unquote whites-only infrastructure. In 1947, a neighborhood just outside of Miami called Railroad Shops Colored Edition, which had, had been built for African Americans in the late 19th century, was condemned through law enforcement basically showing up on people's doors during a rainstorm, knocking on the door, and throwing people out in the rain. The houses were bulldozed. Some of them, through ad hoc negotiations, were picked up entirely and moved to a new black neighborhood, put on the back of a truck, basically. Um, and the neighborhood became whites only as a result of lobbying at the local level. The neighborhood of Cross Keys, just here in Baltimore, right off of Falls Road, um, once existed. Now there is, I think, a spa there, and a golf course, and a few other things. East Towson, um, Baltimore County, experienced similar processes. The point of all of this is that you had to find a way to consistently get so-called market practices to line up with racial segregation, right? There's always an attempt to reconcile these two because they're actually at odds. A true free market allows the free passage of private property, the honoring of private property, the ability to buy and sell at will. But you need the state to constantly intervene to make sure that racial segregation is being preserved at various turns. The most fascinating thing about this is that the discourse of property rights that we see coming out of 1960s California from white suburbanites or 1970s Charlotte from white suburbanites actually begins with African Americans in the 1930s and 40s as they're asking for the right to access suburban spaces or have their own property at least preserved from the state coming and taking it and bulldozing it. But the pursuit of suburbia begins a piece regardless. By 1959, white suburbanites and black suburbanites are drastically different in their socioeconomic profile. Whites are making nearly double their black counterparts in the suburbs. Their wealth is usually 20 times greater than their black counterparts on average. In urban areas, there's only a six-fold difference between blacks and whites. During the 60s, nearly 800,000 blacks moved to the suburbs, but nearly 13 million whites do so at the same time. So it's not that blacks haven't always been in the suburbs, but that the migration patterns were far heavier for whites who were fleeing cities. This suburbanization required government subsidies. Oftentimes you'd see suburban uh, developers writing directly to federal officials, asking them for money to build roads or build sewage processing plants because they couldn't afford it all up front. They needed federal largesse. And on the consumer side, suburbia demanded new kinds of debt. 
The historian Lewis Hyman explains how Americans learned to become borrowers in the midst of post-war prosperity. And credit operated through established categories of race and gender, creating new expressions of class. As Hyman explains, the modern credit system of the 20th century was built by white men for white men, leaving other Americans to borrow in older, more expensive, and dangerous ways. In moving to the suburbs, blacks often drain their savings, attempting to meet the cost of automobile travel, simple home furnishing, or other expressions of middle-class consumptive behavior. They borrowed five times more often than whites, carried rolling debts, and were subject to higher interest rates. Usually in less than 10 years, white flight, drop in housing demand, and the arrival of poorer blacks would lead to the downward mobility of these spaces that they paid so much money to buy into. You remember from the Josh Sides reading, what are some of the major things that are plaguing Compton, California at a structural level? What causes the downward mobility of the entire community by your recollection? Please. Um, well, lots happens and then uh, a lot of the white people in Compton were afraid that that was um, indicative of the total instability of, of, of all black residents and so mm -hmm. there was massive white flight from Compton and that meant that a lot of the businesses uh, that were white operated left Compton so there was massive unemployment and at the same time there was a sort of massive deindustrialization in Los Angeles so a lot of those jobs were disappearing and right. then uh, crack hits and street gangs are on the rise and an NWA comes in and <laughs> and there goes the neighborhood, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but right, no, I mean, you hit the, the, all the key points there. White flight, loss of tax base. Moving out of, of employment, loss of union jobs. In their absence, you basically have this underground economy kick in and the rise of street gangs, right? Um, it's actually pretty striking how quick it happens. And, you know, thinking about the case study that we read from Matt Lasseter's Charlotte article, right, those blacks who were living in Charlotte are themselves suburbanites, right? He doesn't make a point of really exploring that idea because his arguments are, are, are elsewhere. But the thing to keep in mind is that they're trying to find ways of keeping the education high, keeping the access to certain benefits high in the context of a suburban lifestyle. Between 1970 and 1995, seven million black people moved to the suburbs. That's more by far and away than who go from south to north during the Great Migration. And they're enabled by the passage of law. The Fair Housing Act of 1968, which was passed in the wake of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, Lyndon Johnson, in a flurry of activity, tried to find a way to get the law passed before King's funeral. So the time between he was killed and the time and the funeral, this law basically comes into pass. And it's meant to provide very key anti-discrimination standings, or right? statutes rather. But again, the enforcement is weak. One observer called it a no parking zone with a $2 ticket. Right? You can afford to pretty much park wherever you want. There's not gonna be much consequence. But there's a more important piece of litigation. That's Jones versus Mayer in 1968. The US Supreme Court holds that Congress can regulate the sale of private property. Now what's most striking about the Jones decision is that it actually depends on an over 100-year-old U.S. code that was passed by Reconstruction-era Congress. And that code said that all citizens of the United States shall have the same right in every state and territory as is enjoyed by white citizens thereof to inherit, purchase, lease, hold, and convey real and personal property. So think back on all the history that led up to the 1960s in terms of the discrimination in housing, the bad conditions, the restrictive covenants, the racial violence. All of this occurred when there was already a law on the books that said that blacks should have the same property rights as whites. It took over 100 years to enforce a law that was already in the U.S. Code. Hand up. It's United States Code Title 42, Chapter 21, Subchapter 1, Subsection 1982. Oh, yeah, you got to look up the U.S. Code to, to find the specific language. Um, but what's most fascinating about it is that it, it's a historically minded ruling that says that discrimination is a badge, an incident of slavery, which is a direct violation of the 13th Amendment. So here you have a court 
that's making itself aware of the history of slavery and discrimination and saying that events that are occurring in the here and now echo directly a condition of servitude, and that makes them a violation of the 13th Amendment. This is the high point of litigation in terms of equal rights in this country, particularly as it concerns housing, because it's a historically informed decision that says it's not simply about the incident at hand, but it's about the long history of discrimination that brought us to this point. As a result of this decision, between 1969 and the mid-72, the Department of Justice brought or participated in more than 100 fair housing suits in over 27 states, 300 defendants. But the backlog was about five months, right? They couldn't handle it. Swan versus Mecklenburg, you remember from the Lasseter article that approved two-way metropolitan busing in Charlotte. It became a very successful program that blacks and whites ended up fighting for when politicians would come down and try to talk against it by the time you got to the 1980s. San Antonio Independent School District versus Rodriguez allowed states to not have to equalize funding between school districts. So that's a kind of regressive precedent that said you can have disparities between school districts. That meant that wealthier areas could have wealthier schools and there isn't gonna be a problem there. Right? Milliken v. Bradley, 1974, was in large measure a constraining of Swan v. Mecklenburg because it held that remedies like trans district busing could only be done across district lines if there was actual evidence in multiple districts of deliberately executed segregation. So you have to prove that in every district there was a deliberate act of segregation. And that becomes in large measure the new measure of enforcement. And it makes it very difficult to prove that there is discriminatory intent. In 1977, Village of Arlington Heights versus Metropolitan Housing Corporation, the Chicago case, said that it was okay to zone apartments out of suburbs because African Americans as renters represent a threat to property values. It basically wrote into law that that policy is okay that approach to real estate is justified. Again, discriminatory intent became the measure there. Are African Americans being deliberately discriminated against? No, we just want single family homes only, not apartments. In the Mount Laurel cases of New Jersey, this is actually a really involved um, series of cases. It's an entire book that details it quite nicely called Our Town, um, which talks about how Again, blacks who are in the midst of suburban development are trying to find ways to maintain their own foothold, and they're able to use zoning to force municipalities to at least make sure they have certain amounts of housing set aside for affordable housing. But even with this, a New Jersey Fair Housing Act in the mid-'80s allows municipalities to basically sell off their rights so you don't get evenly distributed affordable housing. This brings us to point four. Desegregation policies through the state's lack of enforcement actually enable white supremacy to become more advanced and more modern. We talked about this first in terms of racial language. Right? This is from former Cleveland Mayor Carl Stokes, who you remember was the first black mayor in the United States. America no longer talks about spicks and wops and niggers, but rather talks about density and overcrowding of schools, etc to achieve the same purpose. Going back to the early 1900s, the language of race falls out of urban planning and the language of density in schools falls in. You remember from the essay in Sunbelt Civil Rights, the whole term blight was used as a way to say this neighborhood is blighted, let's simply knock it down. It's not a matter of whether it's black or white, we're gonna justifiably rip it down. And that vague language is really instrumental for helping middle class blacks and local white officials got on board with the policy. There's also the issue of credit. The anti-discrimination laws of the 1970s actually worsened women, African Americans, and poor Americans' exposure to high interest debt, fees, and finance charges. The profits that these populations would provide banks would allow these banks to then extend credit to wealthier white households that tended not to carry revolving debts. 
loan officers would also use zip codes as a proxy for race, right? So race is starting to disappear from the public conversation. Instead of focusing on access to credit, a more proactive policy would have focused on job creation and equal employment enforcement. President John F. Kennedy's executive order in 1962 restricted discrimination in government housing. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act similarly made efforts to keep there from being government-funded segregation. But neither of these acts dealt with conventional mortgages, which were the majority of mortgages. As a result, these laws only covered 2% of the housing inventory. The Commission on Civil Rights wrote in 1973, there is a substantial body of law through presidential executive orders, congressional action, and constitutional case law that establishes fair housing as the law of the land. These laws, if enforced, can contribute to the achievement of fair housing, in fact, as well as in legal principle. They recognize fully the disconnect. President Nixon declared a freeze on federal housing subsidies, so that couldn't even be used as leverage against developers by the time he got to 1973. They tried to strengthen fair housing in 1988 by adding persons with disabilities to a protected class status. They allowed for people to file charges two years after an incident and eventually had fees and court charges and penalties for, to increase monetary damages um, for those who were convicted of wrongdoing. But again, by the time he got to the late, late 80s, f- fair enforcement offices started to become understaffed. And by 2007, the number of staff working at fair housing offices was the same as it was in 1989. Charges of discrimination filed by the Department of Housing and Urban Development and pursued by the Department of Justice have declined steadily between 1994 and 2007. The number of staff at the Fair Housing Employment Office has declined steadily since 1994 and 2007. It's not an accident that that is when the Republican takeover of Congress occurred in the mid-90s. There's been a systematic weakening of government oversight since that time. Residential steering is actually on the rise, according to new studies. And the vision of enforcement that most people associate with housing is still very much coming out of the moment of the suburban crisis. Now, there are many legacies of black suburbanization. One of them is the consolidation of the poor. City of Baltimore, for example, 1997, had 60% of Maryland's poor households. One of the defining features of the difference between white and black poverty, because keep in mind there are more poor people of so-called white racial identity than there are black in this country. It's an absolute fact. More whites on welfare. But by the same token, white poverty is not nearly as concentrated as black poverty. You don't have the kinds of flight that occur when a poor white family moves into an otherwise upwardly mobile community. So the consolidation of black poverty is a feature of the practices of suburbanization and the constant turnover of neighborhoods. Discriminatory intent is still largely the measure of anti-discrimination law. There was a huge case just in the city of Baltimore that the NAACP tried to lobby or level against Wells Fargo, claiming that they targeted African Americans through wealth creation seminars for these funny money loans, right? There was some discussion of there being local black leaders who facilitated these workshops, luminaries from the national black political scene coming down and conducting and giving speeches at these workshops. They would get you riled up and talk about building your own nest egg, and then at the end of the seminar, you would go and start signing the paperwork to have the loan processed. The NAACP's case fell through because they could not show discriminatory intent on the part of Wells Fargo. So the follow-up case came 
from the NAACP in the city of Baltimore, who basically argued that, well, if you can't have discriminatory intent against individuals, you do have the city of Baltimore suffering the loss of property taxes. $13.5 million in property taxes were lost by the city of Baltimore in 2010 as a result of the foreclosure crisis. That goes towards snow removal, the building of schools, the keeping open of community centers, and any number of institutions in the city. Three, suburbia in general, and black suburbia in particular, is largely multicultural and still downwardly mobile. These are images from what became of Railroad Shop, that neighborhood in Miami that suffered mass displacement in the 1940s. It's now called Little Haiti. Large numbers of Haitian immigrants have come in and placed their own stamp on this space. Jean-Jacques Dessalines Boulevard, named after a national hero of Haiti. A statue of Toussaint Louverture stands on the corner of Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Forty-eight percent of immigrants live in suburban spaces. More than half of all Americans live in suburbia. And in 2005, as I mentioned earlier, more than half of all the people living under the poverty line live in suburbia. Today's suburbs are home to 38 percent of the nation's African Americans, 58 percent of its Asian Americans, and more than half of its Latinos. Black Cubans, Africans in Prince George's County, even black suburbia is undeniably multicultural, right? I know, Keaton, you have an interest in doing sports and civil rights, correct? You might want to check out a documentary called Year of the Bull. I have a copy. Um, you can borrow it. And it deals with a downwardly mobile black suburb. It surrounds the high school football team in Liberty City, Miami, the Northwestern High School Bulls. Black suburbs become huge engines for college football recruiting, right? Um, the character in that film, Tori and Charles, uh, is trying to find ways of taking advantage of college scholarships in a school whose most popular class is dry cleaning, okay. preparing students not for liberal arts education, but in fact to go directly into the workforce after high school. Their two big games are football and this dry cleaning class. It's actually pretty dramatic. But also a documentary on ESPN on the U talks about how the University of Miami, this major football powerhouse of the 1980s, in large part built its preeminence from athletes who were raised in downwardly mobile black suburbs. The Atlanta region is one of these exceptions. It has about six different areas that are solidly upwardly mobile, solidly African-American um, in the metro region. But again, not every city is Atlanta. Another key point that's to keep in mind here is that there's a culture of privatization that again begins in response to suburbia being pursued by African-Americans or desegregation more pointedly. And this culture of privatization is in fact in the news right now if anybody's been following the debates, for example, in the state of Michigan, the governor just recently put forward a law that would allow him to appoint corporate representatives to basically, who had, who had the power to dissolve entirely the city government. Sandy Springs, Georgia, is the first U.S. city to outsource most of its public services to a private company. There's a firm called CH2M Hill, that makes about $26 million a year just from Sandy Springs to run all of its public works, formerly public works, with the exception of fire and police. A neighboring town tried to do the same thing, Milton, Georgia, but couldn't afford the company CH2M Hill out of a city budget. Um, but instead of unionized public employees, the city's labor remain ununionized and open to being fired or transferred without union arbitration. 
So privatization is still alive and well. The irony, of course, is that suburbia still represents the best chance this country has for racial integration, believe it or not. Despite all of these very depressing statistics and things happening, there is hope to be found in suburbia, at least, um, for a couple of reasons. One is the higher proportion of homeowners who tend to have and maintain investments in their community for obvious reasons. Folks who move once rarely want to move a second time. When pressed, whites are very clear that they care far less about race than they do about the quality of life indicators, schools, public safety, property values, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is they oftentimes use race as a proxy for these indicators. Too many blacks are moving in, therefore the schools must be going down, right? Too many blacks are moving in, therefore my property values must be going down. Again, so, so much of what has to happen is both structural, but also it's cultural. It is cultural. Thinking about the relationship between structure and culture, the assumption that the federal government backed the idea that blacks influence property values, that's now become, unfortunately, a broadly held belief. In 1970, 63% of whites lived in neighborhoods less than 1% black. So nearly two-thirds of whites lived in neighborhoods less than 1% black in 1970. By 2000, that's true of only one-third of whites. So the kinds of stark segregation doesn't exist to the same degree. But it's still nevertheless true that 80% of whites live in communities with less than 10% minority population. So we have a long way to go in terms of the desegregation effort. So I'll end there and I'll open up the floor for any questions you may have. And, and I encourage you actively to bring in um, stuff from the reading. Um, and I'm happy to ask questions directly of you all about the readings as well. Um. Key. So yeah. you talked a little bit about, <coughs> in the article we read about some about civil rights, mm -hmm. how kind of legal terms started to be used in order to, I guess, justify some of these projects that the state was was undertaking. Like you talked about the word blight, mm -hmm. and they used eminent domain a lot to essentially kick out all of these, all these black neighborhoods so they could build their projects. Was that kind of a new development of the time, or, or was it more kind of an emphasis of using legality to try to bring to pass some of these, yeah. I guess, civil rights issues? Yeah, cities that were suffering from strained budgets because they had all this blossoming population, they had to find ways to maintain a certain kind of belief and really on the part of people coming in that you can move into this neighborhood, move into this city, and there'll be opportunities for you. Um, so blight is a fascinating one because it has its own evolution. All blight really means is that a property is not going up in value. Again, it, it has a very negative tone to it, but it's, it's rooted in this assumption that property should always be getting more and more expensive. And you should always be able to tap into these markets and make a lot of money. Um, but the term blight is something that didn't really get the kind of aggressive use that you see in the 60s especially, that wasn't really happening in a lot of southern areas, especially in the 1940s, just because that's not where their interests lie. I mean, you had slum clearance that was being pushed for by local city officials. But keep in mind that slum lords were so strong that all the money that they were making actually translated quite nicely into a string of lobbying groups that they were then able to make sure that issues and demands around blight were relatively weak for much of the 20th century. So there were other means that you had to basically use, most of them simply being expand, 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 we'll build roads, we'll spend, we'll borrow. Um, but the blight argument becomes really important once they realize that there's a possibility to break the power of slumlords and saying, you know what, there's a new federal program in place, they're gonna build interstate highways, the federal government's gonna pay nine-tenths of the expense, so we're gonna use this moment as a way of changing the debate and using the blight argument as a way to just wholesale knock these neighborhoods down. Um, absolutely. Now, what did you all think about the role that the governor played? Um, again, think, thinking about politicians and the strain that they're kind of under, 
I mean, Southern governors in the history of the civil rights movement are oftentimes, you know, the George Wallace type, kind of frothing at the mouth, seemingly, or, you know, intransigent around desegregation. But Leroy Collins isn't really that kind of governor, right? There's a different kind of leadership model that he employs. Um, and it's one that, you know, one could argue becomes the dominant model in the New South. I mean, does it matter that he's the governor? Or does it seem like there are other forces at work? Good luck trying to find it. <laughs> Please, we can. Well, I mean, you asked if there are other forces that work, and we definitely say that yes. the entire federal policy structure is mm -hmm. I mean, essentially the public officials and governors included are just there kind of interpreting these regulations best way that they can, but at the end of the day, they're still restricted by these uh, loaning laws and housing laws and mm -hmm. all the other right. anti-discrimination and discriminatory laws. So. Right. So, so they operate in a, in a legal landscape themselves. They're not kind of unilateral. And that's right. That's right. As far as you can tell, who seems to be the most powerful player in any of these issues? Not simply in the Sunbelt Civil Rights article, but who seems to have the most influence in dictating the course of events? If it's not the governors or, yeah. I think it's largely just the real estate corporations and sort of the government sort of subtly involving itself. Um, I know in more northern cities you had the covenants racially restricting and then you had redlining um, before 1940s. And then in the 1940s you still have the separation and the GI Bill is coming out with that. And that sort of is more influencing than mm -hmm. any of the lobbying. I was really surprised to see that the slumlords were protecting sort of like the black downtown areas. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's largely part of on the more of the government and sort of the relationship with just real estate agents. And that's right. Yeah, Kristen? Well, I definitely agree with that. And I think that middle America and just their attitudes at large actually really facilitated that. A little louder. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, middle, middle Americans in general really facilitated the... Um, financial manipulation through either endorsing restrictive covenants and other exclusionary measures through their neighborhood associations mm -hmm. or by reacting so drastically to blockbusting efforts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think those two work together. Yeah, yeah, Kim. And I thought it was interesting how even when, you know, federal or the state governments kind of did things which the real estate agencies and which the white entrepreneurs didn't want, they were still able to find like, loopholes and ways to profit from whatever happened. Right. He talks about when all these neighborhoods were being either torn down or kind of taken up by the government because of eminent domain, the white real estate brokers and the white homeowners in the area were able to manipulate the system in such a way so that they got so much more money for their plots than mm -hmm. the black counterparts who were given, I think it's like seven thousand dollars checks <laughs> right. for their property. Those whites were like buying up lots, fixing them up a little, and then selling them for outlandish prices. So right. it was interesting how even when maybe things happened which they didn't want in the first place, they were still able to kind of fix the system in such a way so that it profited them. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. That's an excellent point. I mean, it's it's amazing how the disparity in knowledge makes such a huge difference in just kind of basic understanding of the system and how it works. And, you know, there are, there are brilliant attorneys all over the country who are fighting for civil rights, but in terms of the everyday and individual homeowners who just don't know what's going on, they don't, they're not going to have some blue chip attorney from the NAACP flying down and brokering with the Miami city government to get them the best deal they can. Right. So there's a kind of mass inequality that's really important uh, for keeping in mind. And it's one that I think is key to understanding how consumption patterns, how housing patterns, how education patterns are all coming out of, a, not a big bang moment, an earlier set of discrimination. I mean, that's the kind of key to keep in mind, especially as a theme for the class, that so many different kinds of discrimination that move out of the 60s and into subsequent decades are building on each other. They're reinforcing each other, right? When we talk about mass incarceration in, in a couple of weeks, 
you know, issues about real estate are directly responsible for why there aren't jobs in certain neighborhoods and why mass incarceration becomes the seemingly most effective response for cleaning up the streets. Um, again, the suburban riot that was responded to in a kind of heavy-handed way by the Miami Police Department was in keeping with a law and order moment in American history. Um, that people were very much against having another Watts anywhere, or having other kinds of riot and civil unrest. Um, no, it's, it's remarkable. Now, I had a question about North Carolina, because particularly in thinking about the South, and there are many Souths when you, when you really break it down, the North Carolina that Matt Lasseter describes, is that the same North Carolina that Tim Tyson describes? <laughs> Why not? Or how not? It's definitely a much, well, Tim Tyson's description is much more rural, mm -hmm. much more isolated. Charlotte um, is definitely a much more urban center, much more um, busy center, mm -hmm. especially even today. Um, and sort of the language they were using around it was le a lot less charged. It was much more sort of related to civil rights with the argument for we, the children should be able to choose which school they go to, which I thought was just funny because the kids aren't really going to care. <laughs> um, but so it's much more this is what, where we are, this is what we should have, right. and not like why are you sending our children outside of their neighborhood school? Right. And Tyson was just more of solely focused on like race, and we don't want like a black pastor preaching in our church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so speaking of Charlotte, I think something really interesting, um, I guess it was a few weeks ago, the Demo Democratic Party announced that their next presidential, the 2012 presidential convention is going to be in Charlotte. And I think sort of the symbolism of where parties place their presidential convention, the fact that in 68, the Democrats are in Chicago, the Republicans are from Miami, the Republicans are trying to appeal to this new Sun Belt constituency. That's right. I think that the choice of Charlotte is sort of a symbol of the Democrats feel that with, especially after the 2008 election, with Obama on the ticket, they at least have a chance in certain southern areas, and even um, with white southerners in sort of upwardly mobile, highly educated areas like Charlotte, because Charlotte is really, it's a, it's, there's several universities in that area. Right. So, so I think sort of the symbolism of where parties place their conventions is interesting, not just in terms of politics, but in terms of race. Absolutely. And, and Charlotte's going through a number of deliberate campaigns to market itself as being this global city even, right? Not even just a new South city, but a city for the world. Um, I mean, the, the argument that uh, Matt Lasseter makes around the 2008 election is that Obama is able to win Virginia and win North Carolina and win these states, not because there is a kind of hearts and minds change, but that so many of the suburban districts that used to be kind of these hardcore white conservative strongholds are now being occupied by Latin immigrants, are now being occupied by African Americans, that the voting constituency of white suburbia in these southern states is itself going through a change that most people weren't expecting or, or even accounting for. Um, so, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that there's a, a key way of them saying the future of the Democratic Party is going to be where the right drew its strength from for the previous kind of 40 years. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the thing that most, was most fascinating to me about the Lassiter reading um, was the appropriation of civil rights symbolism on the part of aggrieved white homeowners. I mean, it's, it's happening almost concurrent with the events in, again, blood doesn't sign their name. You have marchers who are taking to the streets to look for judicial justice in rural North Carolina. And then you have this other moment in Charlotte. Like, what's going on? What kinds of things are they doing? Thing we shall overcome at a rally. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, I mean, you see, uh, last year you saw Glenn Beck try and appropriate Martin Luther King for his anti health care crusade. I mean, it's it's interesting how some some of the civil rights symbolism has gained so much more legitimacy that mm -hmm. you, you, any cause tries to appropriate it to, to just strengthen their argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the we shall overcome moment was kind of striking. Um, but there are arguments being made around the country about the civil rights of parents, right? Suburbanites taking to the streets, marching for their rights. We have civil rights, too. I mean, it's very important to keep in mind that something did, in fact, happen in suburban America where they would look through their TV and say, okay, this is what's going on in the South in these really dramatic theaters of contestation. We're going to take what's happening in Birmingham or what's happening in Montgomery and find ways of taking that drama 
and using it for our own purposes. Yeah. There are also lots of quotes in the Lasseter article where you had kind of aggrieved white suburbanites who were saying things like, you know, you can only trample on us for so long or we're sick and tired of kind of staying quiet and having our rights taken away from us. So, I know, they almost make it seem like a civil rights argument because they portray it in such a way as, as if they have been kind of the recipients of injustice for a long time and now they're standing up and now they're kind of, you know, fighting for what is rightfully theirs by, you know, natural law or what have you. So mm-hmm. I, I kind of noticed a similarity to the civil rights movement in that way because they made it seem like it wasn't just uh, a thing that you could pinpoint at the time, but it was something that had been building mm-hmm. and now they were going to kind of, you know, come out and, and really fight for their rights. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think all that white victim, the sense of white victim, but it's, it's absurd. It's not based in fact at all. At the same time, I think it's still really strong. We still see it today. And I think it's, this is sort of the moment when it comes out to the open when it starts. They feel that um, a lot that they took for granted before the civil rights movement has been taken away. Um, their, their supremacy has been at least threatened, if not destroyed. And they sort of feel victimized by that in a odd way. The last time we had a discussion, we sp- started talking a little bit about frontier families, black frontier families, and the question of class within black communities. Who are the folks who are moving into these spaces and trying to push the color line a little bit? How are we supposed to make sense of this suburban impulse in the context of American history? In other words, it seems entirely natural to want to pursue a single family home, with great plumbing and great opportunities, potentially good schools. Um, but there is that disconnect. I mean, you remember from the Sunbelt Civil Rights reading that you know, black elites who are trying to describe what's going to happen in terms of urban renewal are not necessarily jiving with the residents who are left behind. Um, you know, I guess the question is, at some point, is it justifiable to have a black middle class exodus from these spaces that they can afford to not have to live in? Right? I mean, at what point should the issue around housing not necessarily revolve around you know, whether or not you have uh, the city government willing to spend money on your behalf, but whether or not you should be able to afford, regardless of color, the access to buy into new spaces? I mean, shouldn't that be an unimpinged right that blacks have as well as whites to flee from poverty? Absolutely, but then you have sort of um, the article about the declining significance of race, and there's still going to be this sort of insular poverty, this underclass stuck who is not mobile and not able to sort of get out of there, especially in the northern cities and rust belt areas that are still just going to be stuck there, and you're kind of someone has to help them or someone has to do something about that, and it's sort of abandoning the cities and sort of leaving them to deal with these problems, but also taking away resources. And and, and they're not just, these people aren't just fleeing from poverty. They're trying to keep upwardly mobile, not poor minorities out of their communities. Well, one thing I think that's important to remember is that um, black families who are attempting to move into the suburbs aren't always able to. Like you have instances like Chicago or you have a very severe black belt where black middle class neighborhoods are oftentimes a buffer between poor black neighborhoods and then white like mm-hmm. lower middle class neighborhoods and they are still um, zoned or grouped or whatever it is where like gerrymandered into mm-hmm. um Areas where their political powers undermine their school, like their schools aren't as good still, and they're socially interacting with the lower class. Like the kids are interacting with lower ca- class kids and are still being pulled into the mm-hmm. kind of, I don't want to say underclass culture, but some are, many more who are going through rebellious periods, like any kid does, are, mm-hmm. the consequences are much more grave because of their proximity to gangs. And, yeah. Well, absolutely. Yeah, please, Monica. Yeah, I mean, I feel like what you said is really important because it's like even if people are moving, you know, they move from the urban area to the suburban area, but the inequality is still there. So clearly there's something that's not 
necessarily determined by location that's influencing how poverty is shifting and where it's emerging and the fact that, you know, even despite suburbanization, most of the poverty is actually in the suburbs and now people are trying to, like there's sort of a renewed urban renewal event where people are trying to move people back into the cities, That's right. but everyone's moving around, but there's still the same <laughs> issues. So it's not necessarily just a, a matter of location, but there's sort of a lot of what we've been talking about, the tensions between class and race right. that still persist. Yeah, no, go ahead, Keith. Well, I think Monica's point, couldn't point something that they talked about in the Compton article, which is that, you know, as long as there is there are these stereotypes by the white community that any sort of influx of the black population is going to, you know, bring the community down. And mm-hmm. if there's this white flight which goes on, then you know these suburbs with with large black populations just turn into, you know, you talked about it today in your lecture, like these ghettos, like you said, how suburbs built in the 1950s almost always turn into these, you know, black suburban ghettos because of the white flight movement and. You know, I think there definitely is the right of, of people to try to get out of poverty, but there needs to be some sort of shift in, in stereotypes. Like, there, or there needs to be an erasing of the stereotypes that, you know, an influx of black population is going to bring that suburb down. Mm-hmm. Because as long as, you know, the business community and the property values go down because of the white flight movement, then you're not going to be able to build successful suburbs because all the white people are just going to take off mm. and then you're going to have a Compton all over again. Mm. One of the most fascinating, th- fascinating things about the scale of segregation and the scale of suburban poverty and urban poverty and land issues in general is that you almost hear nothing about it from politicians when they're campaigning. Right? I mean, can anybody here say what Barack Obama's official position is on housing? His opponents, when John McCain, when he ran, did anybody know what his position was on housing? No. Why is it that nobody talks about this as a campaign issue? Yeah. Well, it's kind of, a, as we found in the reading, it's kind of a polarizing issue. It doesn't really bring people together. Mm. Or it's not something everyone agrees on, even within party lines. So as I opposed think, to abortion, which everybody can agree on. Well, I mean, on one side <laughs> or another, it's kind of like that's a liberal issue. But I think right. housing isn't really a liberal issue, a Republican issue. I don't think that politicians think that their constituents can agree. I think it's kind of more polarizing than a lot of other issues that they do talk about on mm. campaign trails. What might it look like if, if someone tried to make a, a campaign issue out of housing? What are s- some of the arguments that someone might try to make? Well, there's the rent is too damn high guy. The rent, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. There is the rent is too damn high guy. Um, it's, full, it's so strange because I think it's a, it's, a, it's a dead on issue, but he kind of became a caricature in a, in a weird way. Right? Um, that's true, there is him. There is him. There, there's the answer. Um, gosh, okay. As far as the question of immigration, it didn't deal a whole lot with it today, but it's important to keep in mind that the immigration issue in the suburbs isn't a relatively new thing either. Um, Asian Americans were in the suburbs from the 1950s. They oftentimes had the benefit of having the Chinese government, believe it or not, push issues on behalf of Asian Americans. Um, You have other immigrants coming from the Caribbean, uh, even before their Caribbean nations are free from (coughs) British subjecthood, who are able to get certain types of benefits. Um, so then a whole other story to be told about thinking through suburbia beyond the black-white binary, to be sure. Um, we're going to deal next week with the question of multiculturalism. But I do want to focus on this question of culture just a little bit because, I, you know, I deal a lot with structure in the class and we try to deal a lot with law and politics. But if there is a, a way that you could try to delineate what are some of the cultural expressions of suburbia in terms of how people think about it and how people behave, what would some of those things be? Both in terms of everyday people who live in houses, but also in terms of the business culture that's around suburbia. What are some of the kind of main cultural assumptions, at least? Yeah. Well, I think um, historically, starting in the 50s, and I mean, it still lasts to an extent today, um, homogeneity in terms of like even upkeep of like, the outside of your house, your lawn, mm-hmm. um, like types of cars, like clothing style, Mm -hmm. like what extracurriculars you enroll your kids in, certain things, there's just kind of this culture of, like, suburban culture that was very, yeah, 
Yeah. Well, genius. But then I think in more recent years, there's been a shift towards emphasizing individuality. Like, yes, I'm a white suburban, but I my family immigrated here, you know, and we still celebrate these aspects of our culture or, you know, um, we've talked about how the FHA, um, how their policies kind of contributed to making all the different immigrant groups who were mm -hmm. moving to the suburbs more just like white in general instead of like the more fine ethnic distinctions, mm -hmm. but I feel like that's coming back like more like, it's not as cool to... Yeah just be like a white American, you know? Right. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please, Michael. I, I agree with Kristen that, you know, it's no longer so homogeneous with regard to race or ethnicity, but I feel like um, a lot of suburban areas are still very similar with regard to education level, and right. that seems to be uh, a rather significant indicator of financial success. Mm -hmm. And so on that level, Yes, you see different racial groups and ethnic groups uh, move into suburbs, but the suburbs are still consistent, like, even on mm -hmm. education and finances, right. typically. Right, yeah, yeah, class homogeneity is absolutely a, a marker, if not race homogeneity, right? Um, and it, it, it's become, again, kind of common sense that that's a value that we should have, right? Property ownership means that you have the freedom to be away from certain kinds of unsavory elements, absolutely. Um, anybody else? Yeah, you want to? I mean, in terms of education level, at least, like, I know in the ethnic St. Louis, that's not true there. Mm. Like, most of St. Louis is, are, dif are different suburbs, and the education levels are, like, drastically different. But I think it's the image that if you are in the suburbs, you're, you have a certain class standing, you have a certain, like, level of education. I think it's more of the, more of the mirage, I guess, of of what it means to be suburban and sort of that reinforced with consumer culture um, right. maintains the image of the suburb, which is why people ignore suburban poverty. Right. And so it's the, the concept still exists, although I don't think that it's really necessarily that true anywhere. Please. From my understanding, there seems to still be within just the American culture in general that the new idea of the American dream is owning this house in the suburbs. And it's really a 1950s sort of ideal sort of keeps being emphasized, which is um, what she was saying about sort of they're ignoring suburban poverty because, oh, everyone's in the suburbs, oh, they must be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the wake of the mortgage crisis, this question of whether or not the American dream should equal home ownership is really being talked about in a strong way. I mean, but again, it was a missed opportunity, right, because people want to talk about Wall Street reform as being the potential issue, but the broader culture of housing is still off the table for debate as a result of this housing crisis, you know. I mean, there's a reason why certain kind of subaltern populations were being targeted and were able to be targeted um, because of the culture around home ownership. Yeah, Sylvie. Um, I'm just wondering about the Compton reading. When did the uh, sort of idea of suburbia stop applying to Compton? Like, when did people stop thinking of it as a suburb? That is always the question, isn't it? That is always the question, because suburbia means what exactly? I mean, he used that term metonym. We, we, we used that term before, right? How when you say American and you th think of American in your mind, it, you picture a certain kind of individual, a certain kind of race, gender, sexuality, expression, and so forth. Or Washington equals the federal government. Um, yeah, suburbia is still, in some circles, you know, Compton, Liberty City. Um, you know, when you go into these spaces and you try to look at it from a straight up density standpoint, they meet all the definitions of suburbia. But that question is the question, which is how many people of color does it take? How many bad schools does it take? How many you know, how, house fires or how many abandoned homes does it take for a space to become urban? You know, how many angels fit on the head of a needle, right? I mean, there's, there's no way of knowing for sure. I mean, groups like NWA are clearly marketing their product with a quote unquote urban aesthetic even as they're shooting all their videos in this kind of dystopian suburban space. Um, so there isn't a concrete year where you can say, okay, now this is an urban space. One thing that I think is important to keep in mind is that planners are deliberately putting public housing projects in black suburbs. So density numbers are in fact going up in some places. But it's, How does that work zoning-wise? What's that? How can you put public housing in a suburb? Oh, easily. 
I mean, all, all you have to do is get members of the Public Housing Authority to basically have their maps in front of them and say, where's the most appropriate place for this housing? I mean, the Liberty City riot was a direct example because when you have these mass displacements in the late 60s, and all these blacks who are living in these downtown slums are being cast out. Many times they're recipients of vouchers or they'll be pushed into public housing. Well, where's that public housing going to go? A lot of the local whites aren't going to want that in their community. They have all kinds of strong zoning laws that say density has to be this, no apartments here, nothing there. Whereas unincorporated black suburbs who don't have the authority to say we have rules that state what our density is supposed to be, they're, they're susceptible to planners who want to put public housing projects in these communities. And the language around public housing gets really complicated as well because sometimes our, people are able to associate public housing with being a stepping stone to the middle class, but by the time you get to the early 70s, it's pretty clear that people look at public housing as a kind of zoo for lower class people. And there's no real redeeming quality about it as most people perceive it. Yeah, you want to follow? Are there ever examples of transition neighborhoods or neighborhoods that uh, become black after being a white suburb being rezoned? Being rezoned for? So to allow like public housing or to... Uh... Oh, absolutely. That, yeah, that ends up becoming the dominant. I mean, again, in, in areas of Miami, that absolutely happened, um, where there's a, a concrete step on the part of local power brokers to say, now that this community has officially turned, this is the best place for this newly displaced population, or the best place for dealing with the poverty issue. And they'll make kinds of arguments that are very facile, like they want to be around their own kind. Right? They use the language of natural congregation to say, well, this is where you want to be. Whereas most communities that don't want those housing projects you know, don't have to deal with it. Well, as one last point before we adjourn, you know, just here in the Roland Park neighborhood, they tried to put a senior center in Roland Park, right? a, a seemingly innocuous high density uh, development for senior citizens. And there was a consistent campaign on the part of Roland Park homeowners to say, you need to keep the park in Roland Park. We don't need to have any of this high density business. That's not what the original designers of Roland Park intended to do when they first built this community in the late 19th century. And we will not allow this old folk home to basically go up in this community because of what it represents. So that kind of protectionism is still very much going on, even as folks are trying to find space to meet people's housing needs. Um, so thank you all for coming, and uh, we will reconvene in the old classroom <laughs> on uh, Thursday. <laughs> Thanks again. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History. You might be interested in C-SPAN's newest podcast, Book Notes Plus. Brian Lamb has wide-ranging conversations with authors and historians. The 30-minute podcast is available every Tuesday. Find it and follow wherever you get your podcasts. Podcasts.